Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Beyond Parent Podcast. I'm your host, Liam Dalton. Right on, we got a great episode today. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, I've listened to this man, feels like forever ago now, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, you know, back in, in kind of the starting days of, of getting into the train movement. I think my first time hearing you speak was on Alpha Vedic, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, yeah, sold us some some fantastic work. We're going to have a fantastic episode today, getting some pretty cool topics, I think, some topics that we might not have covered uh you know, too in depth. So I'm really looking forward to introducing them and, and kind of digging into them a little bit. Uh, you know, if you're new around here, consider following the show or subscribing. Uh, and if you like the show, give us a review or a comment. That'd be much appreciated. Uh, but always sharing is the best way to help support us. So we appreciate you all. Mr. Luckman, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me, Liev. It's It's really good to be here. Definitely. Yeah. So the first question I ask all my guests is, uh, I get I have this introductory question. What is health? And I kind of get you to define health. You can take it any direction that you'd like, what it means to you, how it manifests, what it looks like, how to be healthy. You can take it any way you want. So what is health? Yeah, I was aware uh, that you were going to ask that. And it's certainly a subject I've written a lot about in my books and written a lot about in articles and spoken about. And I have different takes on it, depending on what what uh, level you're looking at there's the idea of being symptom free uh, of if you have problems uh, issues that you're trying to address i tend to think of that as curing but not healing that's curing and then there's the idea of being physically fit and having a uh, physical wellness and that's a, a level of relative health i would say uh, Beside that or even beyond that is being more robustly healthy on a mental and emotional level. And so we're still talking about health. And then when you begin getting into more of a spiritual area and into more, let's say, esoteric territory, we can start actually changing our terminology and talking about holing. So instead of healing, we're holing. We're actually going back to some some roots of the of the word healing to heal to make whole so holing for me is an entirely different enchilada that we can certainly talk about it's the subject of my new book which i'm about to announce literally any day now uh, i'm going to be announcing the title and doing a cover reveal over on my substack at saulluckman.substack.com so please stop by and check out what i'm up to it's it's a, an amazing book and it's really about this subject matter Amazing. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Let me I'd love to hear a little bit more about this whole thing, you know, and, um, you know, the one thing that kind of came to mind was, you know, you broke it down really nicely, the different levels of how we can look at it. Um, I'm interested about your thoughts on, you know, the interconnectedness of it all as well. Like, sometimes I find, you know, it can be very difficult for someone to be physically healthy if they're not emotionally or physically healthy as well. Um, curious about your thoughts on that. And then maybe we can get into the the holing aspect. I think that's beautiful. And well put. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. You know, I, in my work, I do uh, a type of sound healing that's designed to help people reset their bioenergy blueprint. The idea being that the, the blueprint is what holds the different programs in a sense, the patterns that you're running and the blueprint can be damaged by toxicity and by trauma and by other, other factors. So if you can reset the blueprint, you can achieve a lot of healing. So I've worked with people, I've worked literally with thousands of people for over two decades now, uh, people from all over the world. And I've, I've sort of seen it all in a way at this point in time. I mean, no one really has, but it feels like that. And what I would say is that I've seen a lot of people who are physic who appear physically fit and well, who are emotional, spiritual, and mental wrecks. I've seen, you know, people who are very healthy, if you want to put it that way, from a mental or emotional perspective, whose physicality has just really gone down the tubes. So I don't necessarily feel that um, when we define health, looking at the general population, we can we can assume that because one person a person appears okay in one area they're going to be okay in other areas i think that's the goal that's the ideal to 
if you're coming at this from a holistic and organic perspective, which I am and I gather you are to a large degree, we would love to see that. We would love to see that in other people. We would love to see it in ourselves. And if enough people were healed in that way, I think we would be having a very different world conversation right now. But that's that's not where we are. We're dealing with fragmentation. We're dealing with uh, systematic trauma in our species. We're dealing with all kinds of issues that are very, very difficult to surmount. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. No, and I think uh, you're absolutely right here. You know, with disease, you know, tends to actually manifest on one plane, right? You see, you know, but sometimes there are comorbid disorders, of course, but oftentimes you see it kind of manifest come out in one of these planes. So I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, back to the concept of holding, you know, you're kind of almost beyond the you're, you've transcended these the physical realm and even maybe the emotional psychological realm um what role do you think that plays in the overall health of the individual because we had an interesting guest on that talked about a spirit first approach you know instead of a mind body spirit we should address the spirit first and then pieces tend to align you know any thoughts on that or maybe just an expansion on on this polling idea oh yeah that's that's really really interesting i've occasionally toyed around with the idea of, you know, changing my phrasing to something like spirit, mind, body, uh, you know, but then I think people would just get confused. I resonate with that a lot. I, I do, I do come from that perspective. And when I'm talking about the bioenergy blueprint, I'm tiptoeing around the, uh, the territory of the spirit. This is kind of the aura. This is your energy body that we're talking about. It's the other you that exists in time space to the extent that you exist in space time you're really interfacing with a part of yourself when you're working with your your aura or your bio bioenergy template uh your your bio field as a lot of people like to say these days in terms of uh where this goes or where, where it can go i mean first of all i'm for a I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, terminology. This works in in writing and in certain other endeavors to go wide versus to go narrow. You know, like what's your focus in publishing? Is it to go narrow and try to get on the algorithm on Amazon and really be successful? Or is it to go wide and hit all kinds of different audiences? And I think that my my approach to, to healing and holing is to go wide, is to work on all different aspects of my body. So I think there's a tendency when people go too spiritual to forget that they have a body and that the body needs to be worked out and it needs to be challenged. Even as you get older, there are very, uh, very uh, appropriate ways to create positive uh, muscle building stress on the body, even when you're in your 50s, 60s and 70s, right? And beyond for that matter. So I would not say ignore the body. I would not say ignore eating or eating good food. But then there again, we get into an amazingly contentious territory where uh, almost every single person has a different idea of what that means. When I when when I say that, I mean eat what is right for you and your your in a sense your cravings, what your body is actually asking for. But people will say, "But I'm craving bad things," and I would say it's because your bioenergy blueprint is screwed up. Let's just correct that, and you'll start craving the right things because that's your mind. You, the thing in your head is your brain. Your mind is the bioenergy blueprint. So we have to actually work at a more fundamental level to correct the dysfunctions, you know, in your life. But this can be done. In terms of, if you'll just, just let me stay on my soapbox for just one more minute. In terms of the uh, spiritual aspect, when you begin to get into holing, we're actually at that point, we're talking about, we would need to talk about what is this place that we're in? What is this world and what lies outside this world? What is this life and what lies beyond this life? What is this human form? What does it mean to be a person? And what does it mean to actually transcend that and go to the next level of what you might think of as evolution of the species? These are pretty heavy duty topics for a lot of people and they get into metaphysics and esoterics and, and the occult, but that's the terrain that I'm currently working in. Amazing. Very interesting. Yeah. That's probably a whole conversation of itself. Probably books and books can be written about that as well. Absolutely. Um, 
really, really cool. Um, and I think that you make an important point that we've been kind of exploring a lot on this, this page here, you know, there seems to be this movement towards this negation of our physical realm and our physical body. Um, you know, almost, you know, like certain schools of thoughts might even push the idea that, you know, um, it's not important at all what you put in your body rather it's just some it's it's the intention or the the thought, thought behind it or different things like that right so the negation of the body is i think can be a corrosive idea um and i think that there are a lot of people in schools out there now kind of pushing this right to it doesn't matter what what we do in the physical realm if as long as you're spiritually aligned or healthy whole um so i think that's an important point we've been talking about that a lot and i think that uh is something that's really hitting home here for a lot of the listeners and um then again there's no part of us or level to us that can be ignored right so you know i'm just thinking back on our episode with daniel roy to us for all the listeners you know uh, even though the physical realm is of utmost importance right psychological factors and traumas still play a role in our overall health right same as our spirit and you mentioned the bioenergy blueprint which i want to dig into a little bit more um you know there's still something there that's beyond the physical as well that needs to be considered in healing right because um everything's connected and you know each of these play maybe a separate role together in some sort of abstract way, but, uh, there's certainly, there's certainly importance to looking at each level of it. Um, so maybe a little bit more on this bioenergy blueprint. You mentioned the mind is the bioenergy blueprint. Curious about this, this terminology, you know, and where this idea came from, you know, how did you kind of come to this conclusion, this bioenergy blueprint? Cause it's certainly the case that, you know, we have, almost a twisted understanding of of our existence purpose you know our realm the meaning of life stuff like that you know we're so distant from nature we're so distant to what it is to be a human being now we crave mcdonald's and chocolate bars and you know things that are truly toxic to us but you're mentioning that it might be rooted in this bioenergy blueprint so interesting maybe you can expand on that a little bit are you familiar i mean i by the way i interviewed daniel a, a year or two ago really really good guy um great guy are you familiar with rupert sheldrake yes so, absolutely he was the first man that i read actually that kind of started to shift my perspective at looking at science in a different light he was phenomenal right so let me just throw out a, uh, just a few different figures that this might give you some some context for where i'm where i'm coming from so Sheldrake has a concept that many listeners may be familiar with called morphic resonance. And it, this hypothesis, I mean, you know, he a lot of people say theory. It's a, technically a hypothesis, but I use theory too. It's just, you know, um, this hypothesis is that um, there are something like there are, are what he might uh, describe as hyperdimensional fields of data almost like storage banks or wavelengths in our giant radio uh apparatus around us radio wave apparatus it's not technically radio waves we're talking something literally maybe in like a 4d space right if we're in 3d it's like in 4d so we can't actually see it or access it but it's there controlling everything and for him this is where this is where species traits are passed along this is where uh where all of all of the genetic storage takes place it's where and uh where gosh where traumas would might be stored and uh uh let's say ancestral memory might exist there all of these different things would be in this 4d space right I'm saying 4D. I'm just using sort of loose terminology to describe what is kind of complicated to describe. But this means that you uh, you don't necessarily need uh, a biochemical transmission for information to be passed from the morphic field to biological organisms and have it affect them, have it literally change their biology, for example. So that's fascinating. 
you uh, have another scientist who died a few years ago, unfortunately, uh, a Russian scientist named Peter Garayev, who had done fascinating uh, research in what he called wave genetics. It had a very similar concept that we have a kind of 4D realm of blueprints or templates that is where all of the information that creates our so-called material reality is stored. And so he did experiments where he could literally uh, use, use energy waves that were modulated to language frequencies, and he could make a, a salamander embryo change into a frog or, or vice versa. Just by downloading different coding from the 4D realm. Unbelievable. It's, I, there's an, I, that's, I'm not familiar that's with actually this been replicated. There's another scientist who's still alive, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, named Vladimir Poponin, who did work with him. Then you have uh, you have research. I forget this this guy's name. It starts with an O. I wrote about him in Conscious Healing, but he, you know, he does these hermetically sealed uh, containers that have just been, you know, kind of sandblasted with heat. And all they have is like sand and water in them. There's no biological information. They're hermetically sealed. And then basically they're exposed to maybe nothing, but maybe the sun or something like that. And they start growing organisms. It just shouldn't be happening. There is something else going on here that uh, can really only logically be explained by a, a different informational realm that isn't taken into account in our physics and our biology models. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the things that drove me out of, of you know, organized academia. <laughs> I studied biochem and molecular biology. And, you know, I came into this idea the the train, you know, and and that kind of propelled my shift in perspective, I guess. Um, I, I was largely dissatisfied with the biochemical model. It's it, it was it's just terrible through and through. Um, so Sheldrake's work was fantastic. Um, I can't wait to dig into this this work of these Russian scientists you mentioned. I'll have to go back and get the names. It's um, a Peter Garaya, Vladimir Poponin. If you go over to my Substack, it's saulluckman.substack.com. There's also some articles by uh, a physicist named Richard Allen Miller. He he created Northwest Botanical some some years ago. I mean, he's a very uh, broad thinking fellow. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy, and he uh, has written some books. And he was one of the he and um, some other scientists. Uh, published a paper all the way back in 1975 it's called a holographic concept of reality and that's on my substack a holographic concept of reality and it goes into all of this and how reality uh, what we call reality can basically be seen as a kind of holographic lattice where you know it's literally the holograph is what's programming the genetics all the way through and it's not that the genetics is giving rise to the holograph in this model. It's that the holograph is actually giving rise to the genetics. And then the genetics is giving rise to cells and organisms, right? So it's absolutely fascinating. We're back to the biofield. We're back to the mind or that, that whatever that thing is that thinks us into existence from another realm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. Are we tiptoeing into the field of alchemy here at all? Well, my new book is on alchemy. Uh, it, you know, uh, I've got, um, I'll give you that much. Yes, it's definitely on alchemy, but it's not on alchemy as a kind of pseudo chemical science. It's on inner alchemy. My position is that alchemy was for various reasons uh, painted in a certain way so as to be misunderstood. There were there were people who just had no idea going back to the medieval times what they were talking about. <laughs> so they thought it was a kind of chemistry and they were writing these arcane texts that were part poetry and part hooey with a little bit of pseudoscience thrown in if you want to look at it that way. But you had much more serious inner alchemists who understood what alchemy was and alchemy is the cultivation of personal power. So that you can actually 
ultimately live forever. Or that's the ultimate goal of alchemy. You know, part of me thinks those texts were intentionally written in that way to be misleading uh, because the concept of what you're, what you're discussing, I would completely agree that that's what true alchemy is. Uh, I think that for the individual, you know, they have to see past that the, the material way that it was written, right. They have to kind of read between the lines. It, it's almost that, um, what do they call it? The, the initiation, right. You kind of got to see, you have to completely see past, you know, the greed of turning gold or turning lead into gold. Right. Like, um, yeah, you that's know, the trap. To... That's the kind of you know exactly mental, emotional trap you you get put in, and if you can't see past it, so there may have been like a a litmus litmus test aspect to these texts. I'll also say, however, there was also the very real threat of the church coming down on people who were you know identifying as alchemists. So they were they were afraid that they would be hunted down and tortured basically. And so, so even real alchemists weren't like giving away the farm in, in, in what they said and, and wrote, it just wasn't happening. It's only been, I mean, really in the, you know, in the last century or so that people have been able to speak more, more, uh, just openly about this and even then you get you know a lot of weird stuff that's you know you know uh very questionable i mean some of it's very helpful some of it's really questionable and a lot of it a lot of times these are mixed together somebody like alistair crowley would be a good example of where you get some really good stuff and some really bad stuff some crap and it's all like you can't separate it out you know it's just really all over the place you know, I took a history of alchemy course actually in university and it was a fantastic course. Um, the professor was probably, you know, as funny as it sounds, you know, he was probably one of the most aware people at the university. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that the I could see like the those in the faculty of science having a good chuckle at the the alchemy professor there, but um you, you know, know that I mean, then you probably that. know that like John D, one of the uh, uh, Renaissance alchemists, was a huge, had a huge influence on Sir Isaac Newton. You know, I mean, Newton was a basically an alchemist who pushed in more of a quote unquote scientific direction, but much of his thinking is purely alchemical. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, and the development of it, you know, I think speaks to exactly what you're saying here. You know, um, there was sort of like this, it, it was almost like the gold rush back, like, you know, 100, 200 years ago here in North America, right? Like everyone was trying to go find the gold, like the same thing happened once they like rediscovered these texts and they were trying to find gold. And, and that's when it kind of really became mainstream, this field of alchemy and um, everyone was trying to make gold. Then they started using alchemical principles in quotation to make like a mimicry of gold and they would use like and they would make like this brass compound and that's what a lot of the buildings use right in their roofs to mimic gold uh, because gold. that was a really desirable thing but you could see how it got pushed further and further into this materialistic view right they even will admit that alchemy kind of gave rise to chemistry and um but again that's just it's just completely missing the point yeah, I think it is that the irony, and I point this out in my new book, is that that alchemy can turn lead into gold, I believe, but only if you've developed enough personal power to do it. So the spiritual side of it, the the holing aspect of it, to go back to an earlier point in this discussion, is paramount because without that, you actually can't create uh the type of energy body for the storage of that type of energy, which is pretty serious, to be able to do what I'm describing. And to give you a current real world example, science has figured out how to turn essentially lead into gold. They can use very 
uh, strong nuclear energy <laughs> and beam it, you know, for long enough at just uh, crude matter, and it will turn into gold. But it's tiny amounts of gold for all of the energy expenditure. It's not even practical. It would it, you would go bankrupt doing this. You wouldn't make money. So that gives you some idea of how much power you need as an alchemist to be able to do what's being described here. Yeah, I, I agree. It would be a tremendous amount of power and it would take a tremendous amount of responsibility to to have that power. Um, Peter Parker, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. I, I I'm thinking <laughs> of my best buddy right now. He, he's going to love that. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's absolutely true. Um, and I, I think that's exactly why these texts are written in this way, because man who who will take lead and turn it into gold and go turn it around and sell it and make be rich and buy a bunch of material crap. That's not the guy that's going to be able to contain this stuff. They won't have the responsibility, right? You have to transcend beyond that greed. And um, yeah, I think that that's part of the reason why they're written that way, you know, because, you know, if I, if I had access to that power, probably even now I would use it to some sort of change there, right? Like it, if I'm yeah, being fully right. honest, you know, like, so I'm not there, you know what I mean? Like that takes, it takes a, an amazing amount of work. Um, so this work, you know, how, how would you, how do you approach this work? You know, cause I studied young a lot, uh, and his take on alchemy always really intrigued me and his idea of individuation to kind of become a whole individual in a way really always intrigued me. Now, maybe he was stuck too much in the psychological realm. Um, but you know, this idea, this, this alchemical transformation of the self, you know, what, what are some things that, you know, a listener could do to, to kind of propel themselves on this journey? You mentioned like a sound healing. That's, that's a pretty cool topic. We haven't discussed that all on the, the podcast yet. Oh yeah. Well, that would certainly be something one could do, but just to kind of reel it in for a minute and to give people a, a bit of a sneak peek into the world of this new book, because it's about this exact topic. We're all over it. We're just just all over it. It's amazing. The um, There's a lot that you can not do, and you could start by just not doing a lot of things. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean, in order to begin holding, begin that long process of holding, you know, take you a very long time probably to do this. And I'm not saying that I've completely done it. I'm, I'm in my own process with it for sure. So just to be very clear about that, but we can't go inside to do this inner work, the inner alchemy, the inner shadow work, if we are totally plugged into the outside. So unplugging is really, really important. Digital detoxing can be very important. And I don't mean, you know, going full Luddite and, you know, just throwing your phone away or whatever. I mean, being responsible with where your attention is traveling. The, the concept, one of the basic concepts, as I understand it, where alchemy is concerned, and I write about this in this new book, is that you're there we have a primal energy that's very special to the human species and we 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 use a lot of different languages to describe it a lot of different words to describe it because it, it's a series of uh, of events or a chain of events things that kind of go together so you basically have this interaction with thoughts and beliefs and emotions that fuel what where your attention is going and and when you learn how to focus your attention or you just focus it automatically unthinkingly then that becomes your imagination and imagination creates your world so when we are going about our lives plugged into other people's worlds Think about doom scrolling, for example, this idea that we are going to benefit ourselves at all by looking at apocalyptic scenarios 24-7. This is insanity because all we're going to do is help create them. So your attention is going to is going to begin producing whatever you apply it to because that is the that is the channeling of your imagination. 
This is chi in action. This is prana. This is kundalini. This is mojo. This is orgone. This is scalar. This is torsion. It's all, these are all words for this primal, hyperdimensional, subtle energy that materializes through your mind into reality. So you're going around creating your, your reality, and I mean that in the most fundamental, absolute way possible. It's not something that there is no there there. There is no outside world without your participation in it. And when I say you, we should, I should clarify, I mean that there are some ways you create your own individual reality, and then there are ways that groups come together to create a group space, a collective reality. So we live in a kind of collective reality that is really, in my estimation, designed to limit our human potential. So in order to begin actualizing that potential, which includes the ability to go beyond the collective, to go beyond limitations, to do the impossible, maybe hell, to live forever, we have to actually unplug from that collective that is just siphoning off our energy when your energy gets siphoned by something, I call it louche, along with a lot of other people. And so louche is basically your conscious energy as it becomes unconscious and you lose it to someone else or something else. So we have to begin cultivating energy by, first of all, stopping doing the things that put us in a position of giving our energy away, even, even knowing, knowingly or unknowingly. And that's, that can be different for each person. So imagine the places where you feel depleted. Imagine the scenarios where your energy is drained. Imagine family get-togethers. Imagine sporting events. I don't know. Imagine politics right now or religion. All of these places where a lot of people feel that their energy is just sucked out of them by some incredibly large force. And I'm here to tell you, it is being sucked out of you by an incredibly large and powerful force. And that's one of the subjects of my new book. So you have to actually take responsibility for shepherding your energy and to stop losing it. That's that's the first step. Once you begin doing that, you can actually cultivate energy. And there's different strategies for doing that. There's different shamanic strategies having to do with things like recapitulation, which is basically a revisiting of past traumas and events in your life and kind of reclaiming the energy that you lost there. There is a an inner alchemy absorption or reabsorption technique that goes way beyond that, uh, in my estimation, which uh, allows you to really begin uh, uh, pooling in energy from whole situations and not even from the past, but even from the future where you could go to a possible future that you've energized with your imagination in the form of worry, where there you are, something, something bad is happening to you in that future. And you can go into that future and bring back your energy because time is just an illusion anyway. There isn't a such thing as time. And yeah, beyond, that, be, beyond that, there are very straightforward ways of shoring up your energy. The thing that I do for that purpose is called regenetics, the regenetics method. Let's hear more about that regenetics method. That sounds really cool. Well, it's, it's sound healing, and it's designed to stimulate your genetic potential to talk to your energy field, your mind, <laughs> your 4D mind, if you want to put it that way, and to ask it to change how it's, I, I will use the word programming your experience, how it's feeding you the, 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 the codes or the patterns that you end up living. And so you can be very changed by this way of doing things. The regenetics itself uses language. It uses vowels, specifically vowels sung to specific frequencies or sung or chanted to specific frequencies. And then the process itself just begins to happen. For example, the, the first activation in regenetics is called potentiation. It takes 30 minutes or so to do the session. And once it gets going, it just rolls out for about 42 weeks without you're doing anything else. It just happens as you're going about your life. 
that's very interesting because it's like a gestation cycle. It's kind of a rebirth period of time where your energy is being re-scripted. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, I think in all of that, I think you've given uh, actually a really pragmatic map on, you know, moving forward, you know, that, that unplugging piece is huge. Um, and it, and it occurs in many ways, as you mentioned, and beyond social media, social media is a big one for a lot of people. They got to get yeah. off their phone. Um, you know, but in a way almost, you know, even participating in just the way unconsciously participating in the way that things are structured now, you know, like, um, working jobs that you hate and, you know, feeling like you need certain things that you don't need, right. Kind of tuning back in. And, and I think for me, you know, one of the biggest ways that that happened, and I, I would say that this is almost universal is getting that back into nature, you know, experiencing a little bit of discomfort in nature. And, um, I feel like that would, would align really well here in this discussion, you know, getting back out and, and experiencing nature for what it is. Um, the real human experience in a way, right. And, and suffering a little bit. And, um, I think that's a big piece. I think that's a big piece that teaches a lot of the things that you're kind of discussing here too, which I think is really interesting. Um, no doubt. I mean, one of the, one of the figures, one of the uh, people that I cited as an example of someone who was doing this at some other point in history is Thoreau, who this, you know, he went and lived in the woods in a little cabin and, he he basically figured out how to only work one day a week, and that was all he needed to do to make enough to live on, you know, relatively comfortably. And then he spent the rest of his time walking in the woods and writing. And, you know, the world has benefited from that. He basically was, in some ways, the father of civil disobedience. I mean, he, you know, it was, you know, obviously that's a title of one of his, his uh, writings, but he also created a kind of roadmap or a blueprint for people like Gandhi to use, to use nonviolent resistance to help free India from British imperialism. I mean, think about that for half a second. So this occurred because Thoreau went out in the woods and got in his own mind and his own heart and did the work. Yeah, great, great uh, connection there. You know, I, I bought Thoreau's books a while ago like five years ago and I've never read them they're sitting in my bookshelf I think this was a little bit of a sign but um it's surprisingly just... easy to read I mean I know that I know that not everybody uh, would imagine that they're not I mean we're talking 19th century diction and style here but having said that he had a rather straightforward style you could contrast his style with with Ralph Waldo Emerson's style. And uh, Emerson was one of his friend. Uh, Emerson was, a, I believe, a Harvard professor. <laughs> There's a very, you know, so he, they had very different, they had very different, well, let me say, similar uh, philosophies, and yet their applications were quite different. The It would seem that in some ways, em Emerson, you know, talked one talk and walked another walk, whereas Thoreau really seemed to really walk and talk the same thing. There's a famous story, I think it's true, I don't believe it's apocryphal, but it's where Thoreau was put into jail for not paying the stupid, some stupid taxes that he felt, you know, that it was unfair. And, and, and Ralph showed up and said, you know, you know, um, you know, Henry David, what are you what are you doing in there? And 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 Thoreau said, What am I doing in here? What what are you doing out there? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah, awesome. No, this is this has been a fantastic discussion. And I think you like we've covered some amazing points that we haven't necessarily got too deep into before. So I'm really, really happy about that and grateful about that. Um and I, and I think we've pointed out, you know, you made some great points earlier when you're, when you're speaking of, you know, the, our external world not even existing without our internal world. And, um, you know, this has been spoken about in depth. So many people have written about this through history, through time. Um, 
you know, that, that we, we quite literally do create our reality. Um, and I think for me, this was one of those, you know, ideas that even pushed me into this, you know, negation of the physical realm. And I think that I, I suspect that that's probably why, uh, many other schools are pushed to this belief. Um, because it would seem to make sense, but um, it's just, it's, we, we, we can't ignore any level of our being. Uh, and I think that's a really important point that I, I just kind of wanted to wrap up on for, for me, at least um, I want to ask for your final thoughts here in a moment, but that that's just something that kind of stood out to me and something I've been thinking a lot about lately um, because I, I've, I was tiptoeing into this mindset of, you know, we can negate the material. We don't have to eat optimally as long as our mind is sound or our spirit is sound and stuff like that. But, you know, this vessel that we're in and this, you know, this realm that we're in, the physical realm that we're in is is almost as though it's, it's a tool in a way um, mm -hmm. to be able to, to do all of this and to even have these conversations that we're having and transcend mm -hmm. as well, right? And, and become whole, right? So we do need to to consider that consider that physical realm because take a look at the example that you just said you know even changing your environment can have such a impactful um benefit to to your being to every level of your being as well so yeah. um any final thoughts that you want to share anything you want to add here now and uh anything you want to add that you might have missed in the episode now's the time mm, yeah just just to follow up on what you were saying the the idea that we are creating our experience is not at all incompatible with being fully in that experience or enjoying our bodies or the world or anything like that, or taking care of ourselves physically and in other ways. They, they are not incompatible. In fact, you know, I was thinking about this with the, the alchemist uh, conversation that we were having where, you know, if you gather, if you had the ability to, create gold and that was just something granted to you and you could do that yeah it would it, you know you could like destroy the world economy you could do, you know you could do anything you wanted to right um so it's interesting you have a lot of um alchemists and shamans who are there's a very there are lots of similarities between certain types of shamanism and and inner alchemy they they just de they describe a process where it very often happens as as you gain more personal power and you are within reach of doing some of these things that we've been talking about and literally doing miracles, you just don't. You don't care anymore. It, it, your vistas have broadened so much and your goals have shifted to things way beyond any of these sort of uh, mundane considerations that you, you don't do those things, right? And so when you are developing your power internally, you're powering up, you're, you're, you're on that holding path, then very often you're just going to be inclined to live in a more healthy fashion because it gives you more power. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? It's like you, you know, eating better, sleeping better, that kind of thing simply gives you more of a, a, a feed of power. Now, having said that, you also get you also get power by taking risks you get power from doing bad things when they feed your soul i mean you know sex drugs and rock and roll we're we're talking you know there's really a lot to be said for being bad when you need to be it's good to be bad occasionally i think moderation and balance are really important and that's a hard thing because a lot of people get really tracked into sort of the hedonistic behavior and it's a lot of fun until it isn't and until it kind of destroys your life but i remember listening to this chiropractor one time you know he was uh on a surf trip to mexico and he was uh, doing a podcast and he was talking about how you know, when I come down here and I'm surfing and I'm doing really great things for my body and I'm like not in my routine at home, it's like, heck yes, I'm going to have some Coronas. I'm going to, you know, eat some really good Mexican food or really bad Mexican food, depending on how you want to look at it. I'm going to have some pretty, you know, bad, like, you know, fried ice cream and, you know, uh, churros and, and whatever, you know. 
And for him, his point was that I'm actually giving myself a mental and emotional vacation by doing this. And it's feeding me on another level that I would never get if I was like a stern taskmaster with myself all the time. Then you start to deplete your own energy because you get out of balance in the other direction. Wow, what a what an amazing way to to put a bow on at things here. That that was that was phenomenal. Um so you got a book coming out. Where can the listeners find this book? Where can they find updates from you? You mentioned a Substack earlier. I know you're on Instagram. Where's the book going to be available? Stuff like that. All right. So it's, I'm I'm at saulluckman.substack.com. So please come over. It's a free subscription. I'm going to be announcing the book there. And I'm going to be announcing your opportunity to get it five months before its publication as an advanced review copy so that you can actually go download the book and read it in exchange for leaving a review when the book is published. And it's going to be published on March 20th. That's the Equinox in 2025. So it's coming out then. So just come over. You can you can get the book. I'll be you'll be able to download a sample and see if it's something you you know you're interested in and that kind of thing. So that would be uh, the you know the starting place in terms of this book. If you're interested in regenetics, go to phoenixregenetics.org and start reading uh, my book. Uh, Potentiate your DNA is a is a um, a, a DIY guide to actually performing your own sound healing. Amazing. Wow. Super cool. Awesome. Well, Mr. Luckman, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. We appreciate your time. And we appreciate your wisdom. Hey, I really appreciate your having me. It was really fun to talk with you. Uh, you're very um, plugged in and a broad thinker. I really appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. I want to thank you all for listening. You should all know that this is not medical advice or spiritual advice or any kind of advice it's for informational purposes only. Uh, but also remember that we're all uh, responsible, sovereign beings, capable of thinking, criticizing, understanding absolutely anything. We, the people in the greater forces, are together self-healers, self-governable, self-teachers, and so much more. Please reach out if you have any questions, criticisms, comments, concerns, whatever it is. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on YouTube and all podcast platforms instagram is the best way to reach out you guys know that best way to contact me i love chatting with you guys hearing your thoughts on the episodes eager to hear your thoughts on this one um so make sure you reach out and if you uh if you did like the podcast found it informative in any way give us a like share comment subscribe review that would go a long way uh and follow the show you know sharing is always the best way to support us I mentioned that earlier and uh, just remember, guys, there's two types of people in the world. Those believe they can, those believe they can't. And they are, of course, both correct. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Take care.